avoid a small economy where doesn't but overpricing its overpricing its capabilities, you know, importing inflation just to remain or to look like the rest of the economies around you? Well, mostly small local economies like ours would have uh, internalized most of their foreign exchange or currency uh, risk uh, by entering the monetary union because 70% of our imports and exports is towards the European Union or towards the Euro area. Uh, second, uh, you still run the risk of uh, not, uh, I, would, I would call, behaving properly. So you need some external pressure. That is the role of central banks to tell in each constituency, in each own language and according to its own tradition, that this is not compatible uh, with uh, belonging to a monetary union if you do not take uh, great care of your uh, cost uh, development. That's what we do uh, in our constituencies and then it's a national responsibility to react. In our case, we normally then call together the social partners, the employers, the trade unions and the government and the government to sit around the table and to take together measures in order to restore competitiveness and if need be to have what I would call an internal devaluation because external devaluation is not an option. And how popular is that you know, on the ground? And how popular are you as a government? Okay. I can be very unpopular in the short term but I can tell you that I have a lot of support in the population for telling the truth and for being right in the medium term. And philosophically, um, in terms of the global reform that is underway, um, where do you stand in terms of banking reform, um, in terms of the requirement for banks to be more transparent and so on? That's the easy part. Um, but some of the propositions that are coming on stream, bank tax for example, is, are those the solution? Are we moving in the right direction uh, in terms of um, you know, harnessing our institutions in order to make a mar the market work? Well, uh, I hear so much about bank tax that uh, I would have to ask you what you mean by it because everyone seems to have a different uh, thing in mind and none of those animals uh, seem to fit together. Uh, so whether this will uh, come to a bearing, uh, we will have to see. My philosophy is, if worldwide decisions are taken, we are part of it. And if decisions even are taken at the European level, we cannot block. Uh, sometimes we can uh, tell people we don't believe that this is the right way. But we are a family and you cannot continuously dissent within the family or you have to leave the family. I think that's quite clear and that is not yet well enough understood within the Euro area. So uh, for me, uh, I see that the tax, for example, is on the agenda, but the decision is not on the agenda. And if there was a bank tax, do you think that uh, Luxembourg it will be one of the jurisdictions that will will play along and, and conform? It's not enough to talk about a bank tax. I think you must agree what to do with it. You must agree about the tax base. You must agree uh, what is the objective of it. Is it the objective to put money aside for the next banking crisis or is the objective to fill the coffers of government in order to lower taxes in other industries? Is it the intention of the government just to be populistic and to say we uh, sanction those who are the culprits of the crisis uh, in public perception? So you see, nothing of what I said is close to a minimal consensus worldwide. That's why it's very difficult uh, to give you a meaningful answer in this. And, and part of your answer also rests on the fact that you need to keep Luxembourg as a competitive financial center, a global financial center. And you've been as aggressive in giving as you've been taking in terms mm -hmm. of banking secrecy, you know your customer, um, yeah. and the competitive uh, leveraging of different banking rules. How would you describe what you need to do to keep Luxembourg competitive um, in, in this climate of uncertainty? We will 
uh, always keep uh, some advantages, uh, like the geographical location, uh, no one can take it away. Uh, also, the uh, multilingual uh, capacity of our workforce, uh, the high professional skills that we have. Uh, yeah. yeah, during the time when, um, when the EU and also the US was putting pressure on um, know your customer and, and, um, and, you know, and money laundering, yeah. um, you put pressure on countries like Singapore and Hong Kong mm -hmm. um, to conform, basically. And, uh, that was partially driven by the fact that a lot of money leaving Europe were looking for other jurisdictions um, going forward. Now, what is your view of um, jurisdictions in Asia which are actually benefiting from some of the stringent measures being put in place in Europe? Well, my opinion is that uh, it will be more difficult in the future to set up international financial centers which are not thoroughly under surveillance and which are not capable of a professional level of uh, cooperation in surveillance uh, that uh, is international level. And from that point of view, uh, newcomers will be more difficult. They will have higher hurdles of entry. But uh, those financial centers which have a tradition and which have built up uh, the capacities uh, of surveillance and which are able to interconnect in the higher requirements of international regulation and cooperation, I think for them it might even be an opportunity because they keep some of their intrinsic advantages which is a higher degree of flexibility, being more focused on financial services uh, compared uh, to other economic activities and being less forced through domestic considerations in trade-offs, in policy setting between other areas of economic activities and financial activities. And how does uh, Islamic finance feature in um, your ambition as a financial center? Because uh, firstly, you don't probably have a strong Islamic community or Muslim community and your development of Islamic finance is, uh, as, a, as a one of your models uh, or one of your uh, areas of competitiveness, um, you sort of stand a little bit differently from other financial centers in Europe. Well, first of all, Luxembourg uh, does not offer financial services for the domestic economy. We are a platform for Europe. So uh, whether we have a large uh, Muslim population or not uh, is irrelevant because we are anyway a small population. But uh, what we have is 38 million Muslims uh, in Europe. What we have is a higher concentration of Muslim population in Western Europe than, for example, in the whole of the Gulf region, if you exclude Saudi Arabia. So from that point of view, uh, if uh, Islamic finance is going to be a global uh, player, uh, it must also include activities in Western Europe. And from that point of view, uh, it's always the advantage of the first mover, which is important, uh, as we have been usually first movers in regulation, even if it was tightening regulation. I think the industry prefers the one who immediately offers the level playing field of the future than the one who holds back to the level playing field of yesteryear. So, in this respect, uh, we also believe that there is a worldwide demand of, uh, for financial products in Islamic finance, Sharia compliant finance, then uh, we should be among the first movers in the supply side of these products. And again, if we offer the products, we also have to have a regulatory and surveillance environment that is again uh, giving confidence to those uh, who invest in such a financial center. And that's why we must make a parallel move in the private sector and in the public sector. And that's why I am interested in uh, trying to bring our professionalism to the highest possible level. And I am very proud to say that for once I do not have other countries coming to us, but I'm very ready to go to other countries which have a comparative advantage in this respect. Mr. Yefimus, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent.